Um, tonight we're discussing the moral argument and just for a quick brief definition, moral arguments are natural law arguments that reason from some feature or features of morality to the existence of God and where God is understood as the morally good creator of the universe. And when we say moral features, the aspects of morality or the moral landscape, we're talking about these kinds of things. Values, which is good and bad, judgments of good and bad. Duties, right and wrong, oughts, shoulds. Moral knowledge, not just that we have moral knowledge, but what is, why do we have it? What's the source of it, of moral knowledge? And then trans, moral transformation and moral rationality. And we'll unpack those a little bit later, but I just wanted to give you a briefly, what are the things that need to be explained in, in the moral argument? So our aim tonight is to understand the moral argument and especially da David Baggett's version so that we can have really good Q&A with him because I think that's the best part of a presentation. He's coming next week to present to us and we want to have good Q&A with him. So we're going to kind of give a brief overview of the moral argument and collect some questions. Uh, these are the four books I read for this presentation. These are all by him. He's actually bringing the last one, the moral, Morals of the Story, he's bringing that for sale for $10. I think it's really good because it's kind of, uh, it's not a dumbed down, pop, too popular, but it's the culmination of all three of those. So instead of buying the three, I would buy the one. And his new book, which is the fourth in this this you know, collection is going to be on making a case for moral realism, which is, I think is maybe one of the more important um, parts of his research. But so our roadmap tonight is we're just going to we're going to ask four questions. What is the intellectual history of the moral argument? What are the contemporary formulations of the argument in the 20th century? And specifically, what is his version, Dr. Baggett's version? And then we want to collect questions along the way. So we're going to, on the, we're going to start uh, with the intellectual history of the argument. Now, clearly, objective moral traditions can be found in the laws of both Eastern and Western cultures. I'm talking Greek, Hindu, ancient Chinese, Christian, ancient Indian, Babylonian, Hebrew, ancient Roman, Egyptian, ancient Indian. But in the Western tradition, um, we, we usually begin with Greek philosophers, and that's what Bagot does in his history of the moral argument. So we're, we're going to begin with the ancient Greek philosophers. And, of course, if you uh, know, Vizzini boasted that his dizzying intellect was greater. Do, do y'all watch Princess Bride? Do y'all know, do do know this? Okay. He said they were morons, right? Right before he was poisoned with iocane powder, which is very sad. So Socrates, um, he's, he's often known, a lot of people know, what, know this phrase that he's known by, the unexamined life is not worth living, right? And another thing is the Socratic method. And he sought the truth. He lived in Athens, and he often was in the marketplace all over Athens questioning people, uh, questioning about their assumptions and their conventional beliefs. And he wanted to get down to the truth of the matter. And um, so he was challenging a lot of the philosophies that came before him and that were in his day, the pre-Socratic philosophers. And one was, uh, two of them were materialism and empiricism. And materialism was just that everything, there's only one thing, in, you know, ultimate rea reality is matter. There's only one thing. And there's only one way to know things, and it's through the senses. And the flux doctrine, which was Heraclitus, was uh, that all is changing. So matter's always changing, and we know that, right? So he just said there's no permanency. There's only change. And uh, nothing's permanent. And so from this, there was ethical relativism or moral relativism in ethics, which is man is the measure of all things or individual. Oh, it went out. Okay. Uh, 
Individuals or societies determine the good. Okay, that's m moral relativism. And skepticism about knowledge. We can't know anything from all these philosophies, and Socrates was very disturbed about this. And he argued that these, these ideas of his day uh, led to absurdity. He, this is his reasoning. And so remember last week we had the bridge of reason? Well, this is kind of the bridge of reason in action for real person using general revelation to make some conclusions. So he said this, uh, if there's no permanent objects of perception, there's nothing permanent, everything's changing, remember? And there's no permanent selves, I don't have anything permanent about me, I'm always changing. Then we can't even, he, he, he said, then it's hard for us to see how we would that we would even have knowledge or have civil discourse with one another if, there's, if that's the case. And so each person, because each person wouldn't have the same perception, we couldn't talk about things the same way because there's nothing permanent we're talking about. And no two people can have the same percep perception of, this, uh, of the same object, okay? Um, so if, so this, is, this kind of helps me understand it. Heraclitus says, no man, and you've heard this too, I think, no man steps into the same river twice, right? Because it's flowing, it's changing. But also, it's, it's not only not the same river, you're not the same person who steps into the river twice. So there's just too much change. And so he was seeking, uh, he was searching for an explana explanation of what is unchanging. And doesn't that remind you of what Katie said last week about needing a foundation, right? They're searching for a foundation. And he was searching for an explanation of what is unchanging in the world of particulars, okay, of matter. And he actually recognized the need for objective moral standards, which would operate, uh, which operate as objective standards that all knowers can grasp by reason. So he also, one of the things he thought about was um, happiness, or it's classical happiness, so it would be like well-being or the good life. Um, and he had a virtue-based view of happiness, that virtues were required for happiness. Um, just a little bit on that. So, so now ha it's not the happiness we think of, so it's not a temporary feeling, right? So flourishing life or good life. I like to put, I think the good life kind of uh, helps you understand what he's talking about. And he went as far to say in one of his dialogues um, with Crito, he said, he argued, made, made all this conversation with uh, this guy, and he, they end by saying, it's better to be wronged, like to be unjustly wronged, than to do wrong. That's how he felt about virtues, how, how it was the importance of being virtuous. And virtue is just, virtues just mean an excellence or a strength of character. Um, so and do, you, do you know what I mean by virtues? So car, do you know the cardinal virtues? These are classical virtues would be uh, prudence, which is practical wisdom, justice, temperance, courage. And anyway, I, we can talk more about virtues if you, if you want. I, I like virtue ethics, so. Um, but the one, the one big thing that he came up with uh, is called the Euthyphro Dilemma. If you've ever heard of it, I see some people smiling. They know what that is. It's a conversation, a dialogue he had with a guy named Euthyphro. And, and we're going it, to, it, it's still discussed today. So even way back, first of all, we take our first intellectual history guy, Socrates, and this is still um, in, in, ethics and in moral philosophy, uh, the Euthyphro dilemma is still a thing. So I, I, we're going to see the original formulation here, and then we'll talk about how contemporary people bring this forward to our day. So Socrates and Euthyphro are discussing the nature of piety. Piety is like holiness. Um, in Plato's, in, it's, uh, the dialogue is called Euthyphro. And Euthyphro proposes, and Socrates wants to know, what is the nature of piety? Because he thought he was doing something pious. And Socrates, mm, I don't know if you are. Tell me about what you mean by uh, piety. And so Euthyphro says, 
Well, uh, it's something that is loved by the gods, by the Greek gods. And Socrates says, well, you know, they disagree a lot and they, you know, they bicker, they, they can't ever agree on anything. So Euthyphro, then he says, well, then piety is that which is loved by all the gods. And so Socrates, well, I have a problem with that too. And uh, he, he, he leaned toward probably one side or the other of this dilemma, and we'll talk about it. But he says, he asks Euthyphro, is the pious that which is loved by the gods, or is it loved by the gods because it is pious? So he gives him two choices, and it's still a dilemma that needs to be answered by uh, today if, we're, if we replace the Greek gods with the Christian theist, you know, theist, theistic Christian god. So th there's two horns of the dilemma, if you think about it that way. The first horn is, if the pious is that which is loved by the gods, then piety is arbitrary on the will of the gods. It's whatever they, it's, it's what they will. For they could love something different, right? Or bad or evil. Um, so it's arbitrary because it is, uh, it, whatever is pious is whatever the gods say it is, right? The horn number two is, is a little problem also because if the gods love that which is pious, then piety is independent of the gods and their, and their, love, their loves are irrelevant. to You don't need the gods if there's something independent of the gods. That, that is pious, right, or good. So um, today, um, moral philosophers, and we'll want to probably get an answer from Baggett about this, how would he respond to the Euthyphro dilemma? And th there might, there's a third horn, there's another way to um, explain it, but I'll leave it at that, and you can chew on it, but uh, for a Christian, we wouldn't want there to be God, uh, the, uh, the, the pi uh, not, not use piety, but like the good shouldn't be independent of God. Somehow there's a relationship between um, morality and God, and it's not independent, where God is, is uh, in other words, God wouldn't be transcendent if, if the, if, um, if he was looking to something else that was independently good. So we, we'll talk about that. So Plato's next, and he was Socrates' student, and he decided, he, he extended Socrates' work, and um, he thought there must be permanent, there must be, uh, he was looking for this permanent objective uh, reality. There must be a permanent, non-material, intelligible realm. And if you've ever heard of the theory of forms, the platonic realm, and so it's transcendent above the material world. So the theory of intelligible forms, and sometimes it's called the theory of ideas instead of forms, you can, um, we'll get back to that, um, is they are, the forms, are objective, eternal, intelligible, okay? And according to Plato, everything that exists in reality has a form. Dog, cats, humans, beauty, love, m any kind of morality, courage. The form answers the question, what is that? Um, the physical world is an imperfect imitation of the perfect forms. Okay, that's, this is how he got permanence into the world. Um, and the form of the good has primacy over all other forms. And it's the ultimate standard used in valuing goodness, the form of the good, and is the source of all that exists. And some scholars might interpret Plato as equating the form of the good with a transcendent God, but not everybody agrees on that. And he, uh, oh, I'm sorry. You're just listening, y'all are listening to me talk. Why didn't you tell me to click the thing? Does that help? Now you can read it. He also was with Socrates on virtue-based virtue -based ethics. 
He thought uh, happiness or well-being is the highest aim and the virtues are needed to attain it. And he believed evil is a privation of the good. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But that, he kind of introduced that. So Aristotle was Plato's student, and he, he disagreed with his uh, teacher, Plato. Uh, he agreed a lot with Plato, but he disagreed that the forms were in an in a, uh, eternal realm and that they were eternal, but actually that forms exist in matter. So that uh, substances are composites of form and matter. Nothing's just matter. It is a composite of form and matter. That's what Aristotle thought. He also believed virtue-based virtue ethics, and he added intellectual virtues to, his, to the cardinal virtues. Um, things like that we discussed in Andrew's uh, talk, things like curiosity, integrity, attentiveness, open-mindedness. These are things that he talks about um, added to the virtuous life. And he had a concept of God. He thought there must be a final cause, an unmoved mover, immutable, immaterial, omnipotent, omniscient, indivisible, perfect goodness, and necessary existence. Goes kind of goes back to our last week's talk of the bridge of reason. Um, this is what he, uh, it's not the Christian God, but he believed there must be an unmoved mover, a final cause. And he also believed that evil is a privation of good. So he said, evil does not exist on its own, but it's a deficiency, a corruption of the good. So like, for example, cowardice is a deficiency of courage, which can lead to evil actions, right? So evil is a privation of the good. And as we get, oh, so, okay, so let's stop with those three. Are there questions you already have maybe thinking that we want David Baggett to expound on what his views are? I have some, but I'd rather hear from you. Yeah, let's ask him about that because there there's some... Um, there's problems with that, right? Or some things you would have to explain. So let's ask him about the, uh, I'm writing down yours, evil as a privation. What do you think about that, Michael? Uh, I like Alex Bruce's weird neurological version of privation theory. Okay, but it is a, it's a privation theory? Yeah, but it's like not Augustinian. It's not? It's not Augustinian or Aristotelian, right? No. You know it goes... It, it works. Yeah, okay. So we'll say, has he ever heard of Prussus, which I'm sure he has. Maybe, he, maybe that's his, his view. Okay, what else? Does Baggett have any, like, epistemology or uh, metaphysics associated with his moral understanding? Oh, you mean, like, does, does, he, does he have... Does he, does he ascribe to his... Of morality. Yeah. Tell me what you mean by that. So, is the good, is goodness simply something that, like divine simplicity, where all the goods are really the same thing, grounded in God's very nature itself? is one formulation of a kind of a metaphysic of morality. Another would be that all, all things that are good are just basically thoughts in the mind of God, kind of right. like mathematics. Right. In which case you seem to kind of strike one of the euthyphros forms where, well, God could just change his thoughts and then morality changes, and then he could decide that slavery is okay tomorrow when it wasn't before. So we definitely need, so, yeah. need him I to... Say, I think he might get into that if he answered the euthyphro dilemma, do you yeah, think? He would. He needs to ground... You have to ground it somewhere. Yeah, it's either independent, in which case, like, morality is separate forms and it doesn't relate to 
not at all, which he right. can't argue. No. Um, and you can't really easily get morality that way. Okay, so he does discuss and has a lots of lots of discussion about the euthyphro dilemma in these books. And um, so he has stuff to say, so we want him to, if he's not going, if he's not bringing it out in his presentation, we want to ask him, right? Or also just pinpoint any questions we have. Okay, let's see, what did I have? Do you want to see what he thinks about virtue ethics? That's not the only kind of uh, moral philosophy there is. See where that, does it fit into his? It has problems of its own, so. And then I had, uh, you know, so Socrates had this, he got on this train because he felt like uh, the philosophies of his day, which are much like our day, right? The pre-Socratic philosophers uh, are much like the materialism and the moral relativism that we see. So Socrates then, um, that was his reason for thinking there was objective morality. I think we need to ask, this is a good point to ask Bagot, and I'm sure he's working on it because that's the subject of his next book, is making a case for moral realism. And we need to ask him more about that because I'm not sure I'm not sure he's going to get into that in his presentation, but uh, I, but I, wouldn't y'all want to ask that moral realism? Yes. Yeah. Oh, you do, right, Andrew? Yes. Yes. Okay. What's the case for that? And do you, what do people normally say? Do you know what the case is for objective morality? What what kind of what answers are given today? Yeah. I mean, C.S. Lewis kind of talked about the Tao, where you have, like, pretty much every culture has some things in common, like, between the Code of Hammurabi and, you know, the Christian law, right. and, like, all around the world, <laughs> different philosophies kind of were getting at the same thing. Right. I mean, he has that in the appendix of his Abolition of Man. But he also kind of treats it as a, um, that it can't be argued, right, that you... You should recognize that you that you that there are some objective mor morals, right? Um, almost like a brute fact or a, 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 a what would Plantinga call it? Yeah, ba properly basic, you know, beliefs about morals, right? But sometimes that, if you're t especially talking to someone who is trying to say they don't believe there's any objective morals. Um, that is not very persuasive, I'm, I don't think. So I wonder, I wonder what he, you know, what he goes into in his book. Okay, that's all I had. So then we come to, and this isn't a complete history. <laughs> We're hitting kind of the high points, um, or we would be here till next week. But... Um, for Augustine really liked Plato, and so then he had, um, of course, special revelation, including general revelation that Plato was using. So he modified Plato's ideas, and he, th he thought that, the Pla that Plato's forms are ideas in the mind of God. They don't exist independently. So we kind of know how, 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 what horn he, he was dealing with, right? And he thought the highest good, remember Plato's highest good, was God himself. And he also believed in the privation, privation theory of evil, which he made, I think most people, you know, trace it back to Augustine, but it, would, it went back further than that. Then we have Aquinas, and Aquinas, he liked Aristotle, and he, uh, he's a theistic natural law theorist, and it, he thought, he believed, that God manifested his moral law by writing it into human nature. Romans 2, really. Um, and he had what was called the fourth way. He didn't really like arguments 
for the existence of God, and he didn't really have a really well-formed moral argument. But the fourth way is kind of a type of moral argument, and this is how he argues. He says, uh, he argued from degrees of perfection. So he says, all things exhibit greater or lesser degrees of perfection. There must therefore exist a supreme perfection that all imperfect beings approach yet fall short of. And God is that ultimate perfection. That was, that's just a, a summary of it. Um, he also was a virtue ethicist, and he added theological virtues, um, faith, hope, and love, to the virtues. And one thing that he added, I guess, I, and I think this was the, the first time this is introduced. So there, have you ever heard of the moral gap? There's a moral gap problem, and we know it as Christians, right? It's Here's, here's the moral law, the should, what I ought to do, but here's me, what I do do or what I can do. And there's a gap between what I ought to do and what I do. And um, so, so if you weren't a Christian, you didn't have a solution to that, you might think that the rationality of, mor of mor that there was, that, that being moral isn't rational because we can't achieve what we ought right? So he said the, that fallen man in a fallen world achieves ultimate happiness by the transformative grace of God. So God is the solution to the moral gap, or, moral gap, or God, we should say God's grace is the solution. Um, he also, he also <laughs> This is coming up a lot. So we're going to want to talk about evil as a privation of good, right? So that was with Aquinas. Um, was, I'm not sure. Do you have any more? Do you want to ask him anything more? What did I say? Oh, maybe we do want to ask him about, uh, does he think, what does he think about Augustine's view that the forms are ideas in the mind of God? That might come up with, with Euthyphro. What are the what are problems with that? And so generally moral philosophers do have to address the moral gap, and so we'll, we'll see what he says about that. Um, next is Immanuel Kant. He's a, uh, a big um, philosopher. He had two, he didn't like uh, arguments for the existence of God, and, but, but, he, but of course he loved ethics. And so he has two um, arguments. One is the argument from grace, and one is the argument from providence. The argument from grace is very similar to what we just talked about with um, Aquinas, and his goes like this. A moral gap exists in what we ought to do, what we can do. Moral transformation requires divine grace to close the gap. Therefore, rationality dictates that we postulate God's existence. That's as far as he gets for an argument for the existence of God. So that's how he words it. And his argument from providence uh, is sort of like the coincidence theory, so thesis, which is this. There should be a convergence of virtue and happiness, right? Uh, on, on if, if virtue is necessary for happiness, there should be some sort of convergence. But um, how can that be when I have a... When we are uh, faced with, with tragedy and, and uh, we, we have, wrong, like Socrates said, we have unjust wrongs done to us. Um, okay, I thought I lost my place. It's got to make sense that, that morality and happiness converge if happiness is our end, right? And there has to be a rational fit 
otherwise uh, we, we, the objection would be that morality is irrational. So ultimate reality is that tra for, for, for Kant and for Christians is that tragedies will be redeemed, injustices will be fixed, and the world will be set right. So we have that hope. And God has declared that one day he will set things right. So this is primarily about how God solves the problem of evil. So the way that Kant argues this is that if morality is to be a rationally stable enterprise, it must ensure the ultimate correspondence of happiness and virtue. And only God can bring about the conjunction of happiness and virtue by his providence. Therefore, rationality dictates the, the, pop, the postulation of God's existence. I kind of fumbled that. Did y'all get that? So just, just saying that um, the hope, uh, the, the knowledge that God will bring, trage bring redeem tragedy and set things right makes there be ultimate convergence between morality and happiness. Right. Because, um, yeah, you can never do what you fully what you ought. In a naturalistic or moralistic worldview, you have to say, well, that's just okay. Right, especially, so you'd have to back up and make sure that the person you were talking with believes there are obligations or duties, oughts. Because so, if they didn't, then it doesn't really work. But if there are oughts and then our cans, and we know that, we can, that, that, that there's a gap, and then... Um, in, in this case, has anybody see A Hidden Life? Did anyone see that movie? Man, no one has seen that movie. Okay, y'all all have homework. Mm -hmm. You're going to go and watch A Hidden Life. Okay. Um, I'm not, I can't explain it. But anyway, um, otherwise, why would you endure, tr endure wrongs or... Uh, and, and still be moral. In my math test, why shouldn't I, if it will bring me happiness? Right, if, right. If there is a moral thought, you know, yeah. they should converge, but clearly I can do things to get away with them, therefore. Right. Yeah. They have to converge. I mean, it just caught it in our, our experience of evil can shake our confidence, our conviction that these two converge. In this life, that's why, as Christians, it's, it's the ultimate hope that God gives us that causes, that is the convergence. So we need, I mean, I think we can ask Baggett about, about this. He, his is, uh, he does talk about the rationality of, that's one of the features, so. So the contemporary formulations of the moral argument, there's so many more than this, so we just kind of chose the, the high points. And, of course, one is Alvin Plantinga. And C.S. Lewis, uh, Austin Ferrer, uh, Alvin Plantinga, and William Lane Craig all have um, argue, contemporary formulations of the moral argument. And they argue using at least one feature or maybe two of uh, morality. Usually, it's the, the, what do you think the strongest feature that is, is of, the, of the moral landscape that you would want to argue from? <coughs> so duties, obligations, oughts, shoulds, that those exist. And they're hard to explain on a secular, on a secular worldview. Um, so a lot of these have to do with... Uh, moral obligations or duties. William, William Lane Craig do, uh, argues, uh, uh, against, uh, argues for God's existence with values and duties. He does both. Alvin Plantinga does uh, objective moral duties. Austin Farrer is the only one on, on this slide that um, he does uh, an argument 
based on the value of human persons. So you does moral value, and the moral value he argues for is the value of human persons. That's hard to explain on a secular view. Okay, so Bagot's moral argument. So it's an abductive argument or, argument, or inference to the best explanation is another way to say that. And it goes like this. So he doesn't just do duties. He doesn't just do values. He does all of the features. And that's kind of the difference of his. It's more complete, I think, than um, some of the others. And he says the best explanation for these moral phenomena is God. And in this premise, he would then be taking on all of the secular philosophies that would try to explain those features, and he would be um, refuting them and saying why God is the, is the best explanation. And therefore, and it's a probability argument, God exists. So he, these aren't all the secular theories he engages, but he does engage egoism, utilitarianism, natural law, play, and, and the criteria he's using for it is explanatory power. How well do these theories explain the the features and the explanatory scope. How, how much, how many of them can they explain? All of them, some of them? Let's see. So let's talk a little bit about maybe what's the difference between most of the really strong arguments you've, he you've heard are deductive arguments, like William Lane Craig's argument is deductive. And a deductive argument argues from a general rule to a specific conclusion. And it's always true. If the premises are true and you uh, argue, argue well for them, accept them, then the, the conclusion follows. And so if it's sound and it is valid, and the logic is right, then you have a pretty airtight argument. Abduction is very different. And this is what David uh, Baggett uses. And it, I'll just give you an example. It's like, um, that man looks tired and he's wearing gym clothes. He's probably been to the gym, is the conclusion. Now, it could, it, there could be defeaters, right? You could get more information and find out more. But you're making a, a, the best explanation of the facts that you observe. So in, all the abdu in abduction, you start with a fact with facts or, or evidence. In this case, we're starting with what? The landscape of morality, all the features. And we're working backwards to try to find an explanation that best explains them. So that's the difference. And there's some more differences that I think he would probably like to explain why he uses the abductive argument. Why do you think he would use, um, like, uh, the like William Lane Craig's argument is deductive, right? If God does not exist, then objective moral values and duties do not exist. Premise two: Objective moral values and duties do exist. Therefore, God exists. That's the that's the one you've probably heard the most. Um, and Baggett has some reasons why he doesn't go the deductive route. So, I think that, um, and I I don't know if he's going to get into that in his presentation, but I think it would be really good. Um, I'm going to add it to our to our thing. Okay, so I wanted to do, I wanted to just get straight so you know, uh, just unpack the aspects of morality, what, what they mean. So values are, think of them, I always think of them as judgments of good and bad, like honesty is good, lying is bad. Inherent, the inherent value and dignity of persons is good. Those are values. Duties are uh, oughts, 
should, right and wrong, like you think of the law, right? Um, so oughts have authority behind them, have, a, have some kind of authority that, that of law kind of behind them, and you're held accountable for violating. And so you have to ask, well, but where does that authority come from that you feel in that ought or that should? Did you, and did you know that you can be, this is something kind of interesting, you can be charged with negligence for not doing something even if you claim you didn't know it was your duty, if you should have known it was your duty. So you should have known and ignorance of the law isn't an excuse in those cases. So that's a hard one, and we have that in our own law. In, I mean, that's secular, I mean, in our country's laws. But um, that's kind of hard to explain how someone, right, on, a, on anything, on a secular philosophy. So moral knowledge is also a big one. And it's, it, it's epistemology. I mean, it's how we know things, how we know moral, m morality. And then the set, that's only part of it because someone could have a story or an explanation of how we know morality, but the, the next question is, what is the source of it? What accounts for that, for that knowledge? And um, so with Baggett's argument, I think he will say that shared moral knowledge is the starting point of most moral arguments. So if Jackson doesn't believe that there's such a thing as objective morality, then it's hard to get the argument going with him. It's not gonna, it's not gonna go anywhere. So that's sort of, uh, you can call that a, you know, it's a limitation because you are trying to get on common ground with someone to talk about morality. Um, the other thing is the moral gap, transformation, the moral transformation explanation for that. And that's kind of like Kant's argument from grace. And Christianity offers the possibility of radical transformation in this life and in the afterlife, which is, which, <laughs> yay! <laughs> it, which is a, a very big plus for um, Baggett's argument. And rationality, how can virtue and happiness converge? That's what we talked about. So he goes into that. And that's hard for a secular philosophy to explain. So here's some of the, I think we already, I already mentioned this, but he refutes the um, egoism, utilitarianism, naturalistic virtue ethics, and Platonism are some of the ones, and there's others in his books, uh, other explanations of those features that he refutes. So if any of those, if you've heard of those and you're interested in how, how those don't, aren't adequate, the interesting thing about David Baggett is, so he, he understands or recognizes that a person that lives in this world this is God's world, right? It's a moral world, whether, whether an atheist knows it or not. And they are made in the image of God, so they have moral knowledge, whether they know the source of it or not. So he recognizes that secular philosophies can go a pretty far way. They can make some headway in explaining morality, um, but they still are not adequate. They, that's why they need the best explanation is God 
and the world we live in are the explanation. So he, I, I think he has a really good rapport with all the people he interacts with. He did a, a interchange with uh, this with Eric Wielenberg, and um, just because he understands that they have some answers because they live in this world, they just don't they just don't recognize that it's a the, the moral reality of themselves and the world. So um, it's interesting. So here's what I came up with as, I guess, the, the, the whole thing. That, and what I thought I'd do, I'll add all the ones we said in these to the Slack. And then next week, if you forget, and these come, if, if, he doesn't address his, address these we can we can ask him i thought it would be interesting for him to say what does he think the hardest aspects of morality to is what is the hardest aspect of morality to explain with secular ethics what do you think it is which one do you think is the hardest to explain Is what is moral knowledge is pretty difficult. The source of moral knowledge, yeah. Yeah, because in a secular worldview, you typically take the position that people's opinions are equally valid. You don't just want to say, well, he's he's smarter, therefore he's right, or he's more moral. Or something like but that. the interesting thing about the moral knowledge is it's very difficult to parse out. You know. Um, especially for an atheist who does believe there's objective morality, that, that he has moral knowledge. Um, they have some very interesting ways to try to explain it. But because they experience it, I, I think that they do go a, f a little ways in their, in their explanations. I think duties are probably, what do you, what do you all think? How do they explain that, that, there's an, that there's authority? It's almost like they... You can try to couch duties, though, as like well-being, or um, you have a duty to somebody because they have value, and you kind of just push it off. But I think knowledge is harder to push off in the sense that... There's no like naturalistic reason why Somebody can come, like the serial killers, right? We come to the exact opposite conclusion. But they're coming through it on this. There's no naturalistic mechanism to get that sort of knowledge right off the bat. And well, you would be surprised what they come up with evolutionary ethics. So, yeah. Yeah. But then you, you have people who are. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think we need to ask him about, which goes with what. What Katie is saying, what's the best case for moral realism, for believing in more? Why shouldn't you just, why, should, why shouldn't you just be a moral nihilist? Um, I think it'd be interesting, interesting from his perspective, which secular theory does he think is like number two? Or, right? Like, what does he think is a close second to? And of course, the euthyphro. And he 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 doesn't shy away from this one. What what about when God commands things that are hard to reconcile with our moral intuitions? How do you explain that God is recognizably good? And I I mean we're taught. What do you think I'm talking about there? The hard things, right there. Everybody asks you. What about the killing of the the command to kill the Canaanites? What about the binding of Isaac, maybe? So things, things like that that crop up. Uh -huh. Even some moral obligations that we have now, like even you know, in the New Testament times, like certain moral obligations that we have that might seem hard to reconcile with what the secular notion of what's good and bad are. Yeah. So... Um, he, ha he, he, does, he, doesn't, um, he doesn't not address these, but I don't know that he's going to 
All I'm, all I'm saying is I don't know what he's going to cover all what he has time to cover in his presentation. But these are things that if we know about it, we can ask him anyway that, that what he thinks. And uh, we can, I, I think we should ask him what are the strengths and weaknesses of using his abductive uh, form. You know, why did he choose that? It, 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 was, it wasn't... Um, it was very thoughtful how he chose to do an abductive argument. Has anybody ever heard of the evil God challenge? Have you heard of it, Michael? No? <clears throat> so Katie got me onto this. You posted something, right, about the evil God challenge? Yes. Um, Michael, do you, wanna exp do you know how to explain it? Uh, yeah. I don't know how to really apply it here, but there's a philosopher, his name is Stephen Law. I think it was in 2000. Five-ish, or at least one of his renditions was in 2005. He, he was doing it mostly in the context of the Odyssey. He said, "All right, you have your free will defense or greater goods. I can just flip that of how do you know God isn't secretly evil, and He gives you free will so you can make bad decisions, and He wants to He lets good things happen so that." worse things can happen and stuff. And yeah. like, isn't there a symmetry there? Yeah. And so I guess in this context it would be, why isn't God evil? Right. Why is God moral? So the evil, that, did y'all kind of get that? It's, it's very interesting. So it's, a, it's, according to the challenge, belief in an evil God is about as reasonable as belief in a holy good omnipotent, omniscient God. And the way they go about, and so it's supposed to be sort of a, an objection or, or to believing in a good God. The two hypotheses are roughly symmetrical, and that's what they have to prove. It has to be um, epistemically symmetrical. So given the symmetry, uh, belief in an evil God and belief in a good God are taken to be um, similar, if, if they are symmetrical, then belief in a good God is, is absurd or preposterous. So um, I, he doesn't talk about this. I think he doesn't talk about this in, in, in his books, but if you're interested in it, I know Katie got me interested in it because she posted some videos on the um, Slack about this. And there are, the, it, the way that, it's, that this evil God challenge is usually... Um, defeated is that they, they're not perfectly symmetric. The three, the three uh, symmetry items, the three symmetry issues, thesis have to hold and they don't. So just, just that was my little, it doesn't follow. But so that's it.